Now I'm pleased to introduce Chris Williams. He teaches physics at Pace University. He's written the book Ecology and Socialism and was a key organizer of the very big climate conference preceding the 400,000 person New York City People's Climate March just two years ago this month. Last month he was part of an August Greenpeace mission that went north from Newfoundland to Clyde River, Nunavut, on Baffin Island to show solidarity with an Inuit community there fighting Arctic oil drilling and seismic blasting, which he'll explain. Uh, Greenpeace volunteers also delivered solar panels to show that even in this area of so-called weak sun, solar power can still be generated. So we'll talk about the Greenpeace trip and other climate matters from the big climate agreements to recent ratifications and the Standing Rock Native American protests. So Chris will talk for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll spend the bulk of the hour on Q&A. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, thanks for inviting me to um, the conference call. And thanks for everybody to turn up on a Friday evening and um, engage in political conversation about what we need to do to turn things around. So, um, yeah, I can talk to a number of different issues related to climate change, but the... Um, yeah, what Stanley was referring to is I just got back from a month on board the uh, Arctic Sunrise, um, where at the request of the community of Clyde River, which is part of the autonomous Inuit territory of Nunavut in Canada, or it's part of Canada, um, which is about the size of Western Europe, but um, has about 40,000 Inuit living there. And uh, they've been fighting a court case, actually, for more than two years. In fact, it goes back a little further than that. But there was um, a ruling by the National Energy Board of Canada, which is a, a Canadian government department, that in 2014 that said opened up the area off Baffin Bay to seismic testing for oil and gas. And um, at that time, there were supposedly open consultations with local communities, but the people who came from the government and the representatives of the corporations that wanted to do the seismic testing, uh, they didn't um, have any of their slides translated into Inuit, which is what people predominantly speak as their first language. Many people don't really speak English necessarily that well or French. Um, uh, nothing was to scale. They couldn't answer any questions, so there was no real genuine consultation or certainly not consultation and really no information given. Um, so they took that to the Canadian Court of Appeal and they were denied in 2015. And so now that case is at, before the Canadian Supreme Court, which is the first time ever since the territory split from um, the Northwest Territories in 1999 that the Canadian court has heard any case from none of it. So this is an historic ruling, whichever direction it goes in, as to whether seismic testing can go ahead. And their case rests on where they given prior and informed, cons well, prior and informed consent is the legal phrase. And um, that is bound up with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was came about, well, all bar four countries signed in 2007. Um, and when you hear the four countries that did not refuse to ratify the, that treaty, uh, that uh, declaration, um, it becomes pretty obvious why they wouldn't do so. And so those four countries are Canada, the United States, New Zealand and Australia, all settler colonial countries. Um, but since then, uh, just this year, actually, Canada has signed on to the declaration. So um, that kind of changes the legal landscape. And so the, the, um, the case will go to court 
will be heard by the Supreme Court November 30th. Um, and it'll take a few months to reach their decision. But in the meantime, uh, part of the, well, the major part of the reason that Inuit are so concerned with seismic testing actually went on in the 1970s. And um, elders there remember what it was like to be able to go to go onto the ice. Most people in Nunavut subsist on hunting, either on land or in the oceans. Um, if going there you see just like pretty much all of the um, indigenous communities across the north and in the south, there's, there's one supermarket chain that operates and um, price gouges extensively. So, for example, a can of Coke is $6. Um, 18 rolls of toilet paper is uh, $18. So, um, uh, and it's... Aside from the cost of going to a supermarket, the food is not as good. It's just, and primarily, it's not culturally what Inuit do. They live off what they hunt. And so, um, seismic testing, uh, from their experience in the 1970s, but also doing more research more recently, uh, and all the research that's come up, come out about um, military use of sonar. Uh, which isn't even as loud as seismic blasting, which, I mean, the industry calls it testing, everybody else calls it blasting, is um, gi giant underwater explosions, basically, that have to penetrate hundreds of meters into the ocean and then hundreds of meters below the ocean into the rock and bounce back and then are analyzed. And obviously the objective is to find more oil and gas, the exact stuff that we already have too much of. Um, and in the meantime, uh, can actually kill, but otherwise seriously disrupt all of underwater mammals and including fish and other organisms. Uh, because most organisms in the oceans use hearing as we use sight. So the most important sense for them is, is sound and all their life activities revolve around sensing their environment through sound. So, um, and these, uh, the seismic blasts have been shown to be heard thousands of kilometers away, let alone hundreds of meters so and they, they go off about in the in the area to be tested which is a huge area they will set off blasts every 10 seconds for weeks or months um, so uh, that is one of the reasons why um, actually after much uh, agonizing and um, decision making and, and talking to elders on the part of um, the former mayor, Jerry Natanine, of Clyde River and the current mayor, um, James Nook, um, people decided to reach out for funding for the legal case, to continue the legal case to Greenpeace, which was a very uh, unorthodox decision to say the least because of the anti sealing campaign that Greenpeace carried out in the 1970s and 1980s which had a devastating impact on Inuit um, income after bans were put in place in the United States and the EU on um, seals, so on the products of seals. So um, most people in Nunavut hate Greenpeace with uh, a serious intensity because of the social dislocations that those bans led to on their traditional lifestyles. Um, so, however, since that time, Greenpeace have also changed their policies and issued an apology uh, in Inuit in local news media a couple of years ago. And so um, this is the first time that Greenpeace have been invited to go to none of it um, and not be attacked, basically. Um, and so I was on board ship to, uh, because the other part of it was what Clyde River had asked for, what they voted to, to want was a delivery of solar panels to show that not only were they interested in rejecting for more fossil fuel production and damaging their ability to eat, they wanted some alternative. And so we delivered some and, and installed some 
uh, solar panels on the community hall more as a symbolic gesture to show how it, that it was possible as opposed to obviously 100% removing uh, and so diesel is is the fuel that is used for the most part and that also costs a fortune it's flown in uh, there's only one supply ship a year to Clyde River everything is extortionate in terms of prices um, and so this will actually uh, economically it help the community because it will offset diesel bills uh, at least in the summer months when there's lots of sunshine so uh, and a report was produced by Greenpeace um, or Greenpeace commissioned a report uh, on the possibilities for alternative forms of development that didn't depend on external sources I wrote the forward to that report um, which was just released um, about two weeks ago um, and so the idea is well if you can have renewable energy in a extremely an extremely remote um, area of the Arctic what else you know what communities where else in the world uh, leaving aside just northern Canada where else in the world can renewable is renewable energy practical as an alternative to fossil fuels um, and I think the answer would be pretty much everywhere if you combined different sources of renewable energy so um, that was uh, a couple of the major reasons for for the trip um, and it's also all connected to the fact that the Arctic as Inuit will tell you and you know in, in conversation the Arctic and, and as people may well know the Arctic is changing way faster than anywhere else on the planet it is the canary in the coal mine as they say um, whatever change is being seen on average anywhere else on the planet it's happening twice as fast um, so one degree C change is really a two degree C change in the Arctic for various feedback mechanism reasons that I could talk about um, which is having all kinds of impacts already so um, the seismic blasting would drive away the mainstay of food for Inuit not just in Clyde River but elsewhere in Nunavut and so that would be something that they're absolutely opposed to because their entire culture revolves around hunting as um, a way of subsisting um, and seen as their culture has been around for 4,000 years considerably longer than capitalism they seem to have worked out a pretty sustainable way of maintaining themselves and um, actually if you look at historical documents going back into the 17 and 1800s when people were first uh, colonizing the area um, actually Inuit lived very well and now the kind of social dislocation that is occurring as a result of increasing levels of commodification um, and neo-colonial policies of the Canadian government with respect to none of it um, is I mean there's all kinds of things uh, I just give one statistic uh, if you are in it in none of it you earn on out the median wage is 19,900 for a non Inuit uh, working in Nunavut the median wage is eighty six thousand six hundred dollars so a gigantic disparity and that's carried through in all kinds of other social indicators in terms of uh, rates of suicide alcoholism um, high school uh, graduation rates the lowest in Canada um, very similar to other indigenous areas um, and not um, you know when when you look at Standing Rock the high school graduation there for example it's the, poor, it's the poorest county in the United States high school graduation rates are 14 percent so um, historically disenfranchised continues um, and colonial policies continue as we have seen essentially into the 21st century so people in Clyde River certainly uh, recognize that it's really about how do they rearrange social power and think about that as much as it is a question of uh, alternative uh, um, electrical power sources um, so uh, 
uh, that's kind of an outline of the trip and, and also some aspects about how climate change is impacting the Arctic specifically and will be a harbinger of what happens to the rest of the planet uh, if we carry on doing what we're doing. Um, and um, is uh, really about a maintain, maintenance of a culture that stretches back thousands of years. So um, I'll take questions, I guess. Good. So now you have to star six. Star six will unmute you, and then you can you can ask questions. Did people hear me? Mm -hmm. Did I yeah. unmute? Okay. Good. Yes. Uh, why don't I just start off? So solar can work out at that latitude. Is there any problem with it working in the summer? No. Uh, no, I mean, one of the great things about solar power, uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, is there's really very little maintenance. So the two solar engineers who came up gave uh, classes, workshops, basically, to five Inuit who will be then maintaining them. But uh, they've been put at they've they're put at a specific angle to take into account. You know, they're, they're not going to rotate or move with the sun. But the sun is up for 24 hours a day. When I, when I was there, I just got back two weeks ago, there was maybe two hours of darkness, but it was ne it's never really fully dark. And actually, solar panels work better in, in the cold than they do in the heat because the, the hotter they are, um, the more resistance. So it's not really the heat, heat that you want. It's the, it's the light. And so as long as there's light, you've got solar energy. Obviously, the percentage of solar is going to vary over the year, and in the winter it's not going to be much use. But that's why you would complement it with uh, wind turbines, for example. But the upfront costs of solar are pretty low. Um, this will offset several thousand dollars a year on the community um, building. And so it's, you know, it's going to be tested, and, and if people think that it's viable for their community, then... The Canadian government has a policy now that it says, Trudeau has just said, he wants to respect Indigenous rights and he wants to provide funding for alternative, of what, specifically of ways of getting off diesel. He said that in March in a joint statement with Obama um, when they were talking about the Arctic. Um, so it's a question of holding him to his word, just the same as all the other politicians. But... Um, yeah, I mean, they have to be put at a certain height above the ground because of the snow drifts can be several feet. Um, and uh, there are some wind issues. It's pretty windy, but that actually makes it good for wind turbines, which now there are, there's been developed low temperature wind turbines because that is a problem. Because, I mean, the great thing about PV panels too, there's no moving parts. So uh, unlike wind turbines, which are a bit more complicated, so um, in many ways, you know, if you coupled that with some storage and actually uh, it wasn't just on the community building, there was also um, some solar panels that are going to be mounted on sleds because that's what one community member, he came up with the idea. And so um, there was what, there's one panel that's designed to be mounted on the sleds that they use and then have power battery so that when they go um, to camp, they periodically go hunting for like two or three weeks at a time, then um, they'll have electricity. So, um, yeah, there's different ways in which solar power can be used in the Arctic to help people continue with the lives that they want to lead. That's great. Uh, next question, and if you could just say your name when you ask your question. You had mentioned, and this is Kate, um, you had mentioned that um, for the, the Inuits who were making um, 19,000 19, and the work they were doing and the non-Inuits were making 86,000, what, what were they doing, the, the non-Inuit people in their jobs? Well, um, they're actually most of the people who run the government. So even oh, so though government people. Oh. 
Yeah, they're government people. So mm-hmm. they're government people, but they're also there's mining that goes on. There are there are, um, several mines uh, in Nunavut, but mostly they fly in outside workers. But also, um, there are almost no Inuit nurses or teachers. They're all agency workers, mm-hmm. so they fly. So they fly those in as well. Mm-hmm. So. Um, between the nurses, the teachers, and the government workers, and the ministers, um, it's a it's a it's an autonomous territory, but it's a non-indigenous led political leadership. So, um, um, so uh, yeah, that's the those are the jobs that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're all at the top end of society, essentially, mm-hmm. and and Inuit. They do their, they, um, most people hunt. And in fact, there was a survey that was carried out uh, four, three years ago that said 75% uh, across, in, across the whole of Nunavut and 75% of Inuit said they did not want only paid employment. They wanted to do both if they had to. One, uh, one, one um, subsistence hunting for food and cultural reasons and uh, secondarily paid employment. Only 15% of, of uh, Inuit wanted just paid employment. Mm-hmm. So for the paid employment, what, what is it that they do for that besides, besides the hunting? What, what is it they do to make money? Well, there's a huge uh, amount of unemployment is the first thing. Um, they, do they also work in the mines along with that? They, yeah, they do unskilled labor in the mines. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. do cleaning, cleaning work, any, any kind of ancillary uh, jobs. Um, there, are some, there's a, there are some cultural centers. Um, you know, uh, even, even the police are, are, are non-Inuit. Hmm. The the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are, are you know shipped in and they do six month contracts or whatever. Mm-hmm. So anything um, that requires training um, is not not available to the Inuits. Then. No, and there's no money uh-huh. provided yeah. by the government to do uh-huh. that to do any training. Because uh-huh. hmm. the obvious long term solution. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I, thank I, you. Sorry, I interrupted, but. Uh, who has yeah, the other question? people want to, yeah, okay. I, I have a question. This is Francis. Hello, Chris. Me? Yeah, hello. Hello. Okay, good. Well, uh, this is Francis. And um, you said that the Inuits were um, furious at Greenpeace for having the, um, the boycott on hunting, on seal hunting. And... I was just wondering if there was any progress that if, I was wondering if Greenpeace has made any inroads in terms of healing that, um, that scar between their culture and the Greenpeace culture, or if it's still a situation of great enmity from the Inuits toward the Greenpeace people. Yeah, it depends who you talk to, really. Um, certainly, this was broadcast by uh, Inuit media um, as, a, as Greenpeace were visiting, so everybody knew about it. People, there's no cell phone coverage or anything like that, so people communicate by radio, but um, and the internet, obviously. Uh, Facebook is really big, but um, although only within people's homes there's no wireless outside of that but um, it depends which Inuit community you go to because everybody's different about what they think and, and this was kind of championed by a few people the former mayor in particular to say well nobody else is going to help us we can't fight this court case on, the, on our own should we l- look at you know an environmental organization, specifically Greenpeace. So he went, Jerry went to talk to some elders. They gave him permission to speak to Greenpeace. And um, Greenpeace have kind of steadily been changing their policies. They admit that they made all kinds of mistakes in the 1980s. They admit that their policies were essentially racist. 
um, and um, they have got a new indigenous policy of their own about how to do this. They uh, had internal political fights, I know, with, you know, I mean, Greenpeace came to fame, obviously, with their anti-sealing and anti-whaling campaigns of the 1970s and 80s. So this is kind of their bedrock part of their politics uh, that they are changing and, and seeing that there is a, a huge difference between uh, commercial sealing and whaling and what people have been doing for thousands of years. So uh, the trip was at the invitation of the local community. It went really well. And I think is part of an ongoing process where people are very wary of uh, throughout northern canada and greenland too uh of an organization that you know didn't really differentiate and uh came in there with all of the answers you know a bunch of white people come in with all the answers and say you shouldn't be doing this and had gigantic social impacts um in terms of uh devastating the the the, the way in which they were making some money from from seals Good. So uh, perhaps now another question. Thank you. Uh, well, I could ask about the, the you know, the, the bigger question about the climate agreements and what happened, I guess, this last week, these climate ratifications. Exactly what were they and why are they important? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, there's, there's certainly very significant. Um, I mean, I, I don't think, be interested to hear what people think uh, on the call, but I don't think Paris was historic in, in, in any way other than historic amounts of PR. PR. Um, the... Uh, because, I mean, even if they do everything that they say they're going to do from the Paris Climate Accords, the Earth is going to warm up by 3.6 Celsius. And, you know, for, for the politicians to do everything that they say they will do with regard to climate or pretty much anything else would be historically unprecedented. So, yes, 20, 26 countries, China and the U.S. Uh, predominantly, have signed on to say that they will do the Paris Climate Accord, which are also voluntary, so it doesn't actually matter if they do it or not. Um, and it's all about mostly carbon trading. It doesn't talk about uh, specifically um, ocean ships. Shipping is excluded from the accords. So you could, so you could say, yeah, it's historic that 192 countries have signed on to it, but they signed on to something that they know that they can do, and it, even if they can't, it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's, it's certainly not up to the scale of the problem. And despite all of the rhetoric and you know self-congratulatory speeches from all the world leaders, and now Obama saying he's leading the world, I don't think that he's leading the world further toward climate change. How about the, what was the trip like? I mean, you went two thousand. It was a two thousand kilometers from Newfoundland. I mean, how long did it take to do that? Uh, yeah, the trip was actually amazing. And just to talk about the scenery and and what it was like a little bit, because that is incredible. I mean, I never thought I would have. To, I've been to Alaska and uh, I've been to Dead Horse, the the BP North Slope um, site for uh, at the in, invitation of. BP actually a few years ago but um, I've never been to the Canadian Arctic and uh, yeah it took nine days to sail from in an icebreaker uh, from and the Arctic Sunrise is the same ship that was impounded by the Russians a couple of years ago for two months but it took us nine days to sail from St. John's Newfoundland to Clyde River Baffin Island which is uh, kind of the same latitude as southwest Greenland. And, um, yeah, as soon as we came out of the harbor, basically, in St. John's, there were already whales um, all around the ship. 
and uh, sailing up heavy fog uh, depressingly little ice actually we didn't in fact need an icebreaker uh, wow. and um, yes yeah, so there was there were some floating giant icebergs that come from Greenland which is not a good sign anyway really but uh, we know that you know, February was the lowest sea ice, ice extent for February. It's the lowest for 37 years. Um, it, it, this September may not be turned out to be as low as 2012, which is actually the record low for sea ice extent. But um, sea ice extent has gone down by 50% from 8 million square kilometers to 4 million square kilometers uh, since we started satellite measuring it. But more importantly than that, even, is the volume of sea ice has gone down by uh, 100% because it's like 50% less area and 50% less thickness. And most of the sea ice now, larger amount of it, is no longer the multi-year ice that exists all year round. It's just first-year ice. So it's a very different kind of terrain. And um, did see, uh, certainly saw polar bears saw a load of narwhals. Actually, narwhals are these incredible creatures with a giant spike on their nose. Um, it's actually a, a, a tooth, in fact, that grows outwards um, to a meter or more. Um, and uh, 90% of narwhals live in Baffin Bay. And, uh, so they would, and they're tremendously sensitive to sound. So all of their feeding grounds and, and so on would be affected. Um, and it was not that cold actually you could be out on deck in flip-flops and shorts in the daytime if the sun was out yeah um i mean i wasn't expecting it to be absolutely freezing but it was well above that so when it was sunny um and the rest of the time it was you know periodically foggy and rough the ocean but um yep saw a lot of seals did see a number of polar bears um, and caught a lot of and ate a lot of Arctic char, which is delicious. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and it just like the colors of the ice in the icebergs, I mean, it's, a, it's this incredible translucent, bright uh, electric blue color the uh, much of the ice and actually we did um fly with via helicopter to samford field which is famous for all kinds of things um in terms of extreme sports stuff but um is a, a, a the cliffs there are a mile high straight down into the ocean they should be covered in glaciers but all the glaciers are in huge retreats so they don't many of them don't make it to the ocean anymore um that was beautiful, terrifying, and terrifying at the same time to hear, the, hear Inuit talk about the way in which glaciers used to overhang the cliffs and, and, and they didn't melt. So there, there are giant waterfalls flowing down from the side of the cliffs into the fjord because of the melting glaciers, whereas before, rather than melt, they would crack, according to Inuit, older Inuit because they would overhang and be fully formed and never really, I mean, obviously there's melting all the time. In, in every summer there's always been melting, but the glaciers were much more extensive and covered the whole land. So we definitely saw land that had not seen sunlight in 20,000 years or more. Wow. And, and what kind of land is it? Is it? granite i mean i don't know anything about it it is granite there are there are no trees um it is it looks you know if you just look at it it looks like rock it looks kind of pretty barren but obviously there are all kinds of plants low level plants it's tundra that uh, exists there the inuit hunt caribou uh that's probably their favorite meat um at least this group, this community anyway, it, it varies because some Inuit hunt more walrus, some hunt more seal, some hunt more caribou. They're all different um, cultures within the overall culture. 
So, um, but yeah, it, it, uh, it's very rocky, very dry, but with lots of little rivers running through it because of melt pools from, from the ice. Um, so it, in, in, in one sense, it's a very austere, I mean, it is a desert, it's classified as a desert, just like Antarctica. Um, but that doesn't mean to say, contrary to people's, most people, many people's ideas about deserts, there's plenty of life. It's a stable ecosystem um, that you know people live there. It's their home. Mm. Uh, other questions? We have about five ten minutes left. I don't want to hog everything. You you had mentioned that this is Kate. Um, you had mentioned that it was. So it was you were you were sort of surprised I, I think that it was so warm was it was it unusually warm did they did the Inuit say that it was a very warm season or was is this usual um, well I mean it's not so unusually warm exactly but um, this year has been I mean there were times period periods of time in the Arctic this year when it was uh, at 20 Celsius higher than it should have been, you know, like 35 Fahrenheit, uh, massively higher than it should have been. When I was there for the last month, it was a lot warmer. And and I think one of the most telling uh, comments on it was from an elder who said, when you go outside now, the sun never used to be hot. It used to be warm this time of year but it didn't used to be hot. Hmm. Now it's hot. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So the ex- yeah, so they their can actually feel that difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their, their experience mm-hmm. to them is it's different. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I guess I was just, just thinking about the caribou. Um, wh- where do they live if, they, they're, if they're, there's no um, forest? or is there, I guess there's for- there must be forest somewhere. Well, uh, not so far north, actually. Um, the the boreal forest is further south, but caribou live on lichen, so they don't need trees. And although... For shelter actually, or anything? Hmm. No, no. Yeah. They just wander around mm-hmm. on the tundra, mm-hmm. and they, mm-hmm. dig, they, they dig up lichen. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Although um, they are already having problems and Inuit have not been able to hunt very many of them because right across Canada, Canada, actually, for unknown reasons right now, um, caribou has declined by something like 80 or 90%. So wow. uh, there's, a, there's a giant reduction in caribou across Canada at the moment. I mean, there's still lots of them. It's not like they're endangered. But... Um, they, they used to be common, and, and this year they're not. So, or the last couple of years. So people are still trying to figure out why it's, that is so widespread. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, they are adapted to cold temperatures, and all of this warm temperature is definitely not so good for them. Because mm-hmm. the other problem is, um, you know, this is what happens with with climate change. Not all species adapt at the same rates. So, yes, some species move, but then where do the others go? Or what happens if what they eat can't move with them? And so what's been happening as the, as the oceans have been warming, um, which you know, sets off more feedback mechanisms in terms of melting ice and so on, um, southern, more generalized fish are moving into Arctic waters looking for colder water, but they're displacing Arctic, more specialized fish uh, with, you know, there's nowhere else to go. There's no more colder water. So their ranges are shrinking as other fish are moving in. And so this is leading to all kinds of other disruptions for anything that depends on the fish that used to be there. So, uh, and the same goes on, on, on land where species are migrating further north in search of um, places where it's cooler, they're adapted to the, that kind of temperature, then they have to look for food, which may or may not be moving at the same rate. 